welcome everybody. We're just waiting a little bit for people to trickle into the room. Really glad to have you all here today for our exciting webinar. As you come in, uh, please make sure at the bottom of your screen that you're selecting the interpretation language that you'd like to have. You can choose either English or French. Uh, so please make sure that you're doing that and that'll be the language that you hear, um, you hear come through. So if you'd like to hear everything in English, please make sure that you click on English. And if you'd like to hear things in French, please make sure that you click on the French tab. So thank you everyone for joining us today. We see some more people trickling into the room, which is fantastic to see. I'm well, very excited to have you here with us today. As you're coming in, please make sure that you're clicking on your interpretation language. You can find it on the little globe at the bottom of the screen. And there's some helpful guides on the screen so that you can find the right room for you. My name is Christian and I'm the head of stakeholder engagement at Farm Radio International. And I'll be given a couple of quick webinar how to's for today and then turning it over. But we'll give it another minute or so for people to find their way into the webinar. Great. So without further delay, a um, couple of quick housekeeping items. Last time that I'll mention, please make sure that you're selecting your interpretation language for this webinar today, either English or French. Uh, and also, we'll make sure that we answer any questions that you might have at the end of the webinar. Please make sure you're either using the Q&A function or the chat function, and we'll make sure that we're taking any questions that are being posed and either combine them together to get to as many as possible, or make sure we have a good variety of questions being answered. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to our executive director, Kevin Perkins, to start us off, us off for this webinar. Thank you, Christian, and welcome everyone to this webinar hosted by Farm Radio International. It's being offered to share some of what we've been hearing in Africa and uh, from Canadians in these early days of the nature-based solutions programs that are part of Canada's new Partnering for Climate initiative. Let me begin by recognizing that many or most of us, uh, the people attending this seminar, including me, are based in Canada and a commitment to truth and reconciliation process. Uh, open this meeting with an acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples of the lands that we are on today. From my place in Ottawa, I'm sitting on the traditional and unceded territories of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people, whose culture and nature positive stewardship of this land is nurtured and continues to nurture it for current and future generations. I invite you to appreciatively reflect upon the land that you're located on wherever it may be and its current and historical relationships between peoples, plants, animals, and landscapes. Now it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome uh, Miriam Montrat, the Director General for Sustainable Economic Growth Partnerships at Global Affairs Canada, who will formally open this webinar with some remarks. Ms. Montrat is a, a public service executive leader with more than 19 years of experience in public policy administration and transformative management, both at the national and international levels. 
She's provided senior leadership to the Canada School of Public Service, UNESCO, the Human Rights Commission, Industry Canada, and the Privy Council Office. Throughout, she's been a powerful human rights champion. Miriam, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Kevin. And thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's webinar. Uh, I too would like to start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from Ottawa and thus from the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. I recognize that we work in different places and that you may therefore be joining this webinar from a different traditional indigenous territory. And I too encourage you to take a moment to reflect on and acknowledge this. Indigenous knowledge and stewardship have an essential role to play in helping to address many of the ongoing challenges facing the world and are particularly important in the area of nature-based solutions. Farm Radio International is one of the many Canadian organizations playing a role in increasing understanding of and capacity in nature-based solutions for climate change adaptation. In 2021, Canada announced a doubling of its previous climate change commitment of 2.65 billion to 5.3 billion over five years. Within this new financial commitment, Canada increased the share of funding going to climate adaptation in the form of grants and contribution, both of which had been called for by Canadian civil society and developing country partners. Recognizing the interdependency of climate change and biodiversity, Canada also committed that 1 billion of our climate finance will be nature positive, helping to support developing countries in their climate actions, while also generating biodiversity co-benefits. The Partnering for Climate Initiative, which we launched in February this year, was put into place to leverage the climate action expertise and commitment of organizations in Canada. 315 million was allocated to fund projects from civil society, indigenous peoples, and other organizations in Canada that will support climate change adaptation in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world. 15 million of the 315 million will be channeled through the Indigenous Peoples Partnering for Climate Initiative, which emphasizes the importance of Indigenous climate leadership. It also seeks to foster partnerships between Indigenous peoples in Canada and in developing countries to build the climate resilience of Indigenous peoples in developing countries. Global Affairs Canada developed this initiative with national Indigenous organizations, and we're very proud of that. The remaining 300 million is targeted to Sub-Saharan Africa. We hope to be able to announce the first set of projects from this envelope in the next couple of months. In addition to this, Indigenous and Sub-Saharan Africa programming, the Partnering for Climate Initiative includes a commitment to knowledge sharing. This includes a nature-based climate solutions and biodiversity community of practice which is being developed in collaboration with the Canadian Coalition on Climate Change and Development, of which Farm Radio International is a member. The goal of this community of practice is to share real-time lessons learned from partnering for climate projects and efforts to promote nature-based climate solutions in developing countries and in Canada. If you are interested in joining this community of practice, please get in touch with Kerry Max on my team. He will share an email address in the chat. We hope that these knowledge sharing efforts will help inform climate action around the world and deepen the knowledge and capacities of organizations in Canada. Which brings us to this webinar and the Farm Radio International project that is behind it. In 2021, ahead of the launching of launching the Partnering for Climate Initiative, we realized that we needed a dedicated project to do three things. One, explain and promote nature-based solution for climate change adaptation. Two, gather evidence on the needs, challenges, and opportunities of rural communities in adapting to climate change. And finally, three, 
increase Canadian interest and engagement in Canada's support of climate adaptation in developing countries using nature-based solutions by disseminating success stories from Africa in Canada. Given their unique role in implementing gender-inclusive interactive radio programs across Africa to advance similar objectives, we invited Farm Radio International to submit a proposal. This resulted in the On Air for Gender Inclusive Nature-Based Climate Solutions project. One of the most exciting features of this project is the On Air Dialogues, through which rural people are invited through engaging radio programs to share their own experiences, knowledge, perspectives, and needs with respect to nature-based solutions. Two of these on-air dialogues have already been conducted in Ethiopia and Burkina Faso. As you will see, people in rural Africa are keen to have their voices heard and to share their ideas about how to adapt to climate change and protect biodiversity. It is also important that Canadians be aware and supportive of our efforts to partner for climate in Africa. As you will hear, Farm Radio International commissioned an opinion poll to answer these and related questions here in Canada. I think you will find the responses both interesting and hopeful. In addition to the findings from the on-air dialogues and the opinion poll, Farm Radio International has kicked off the on-air for gender-inclusive nature-based climate solutions project by conducting comprehensive state of play studies in six sub-Saharan African countries and several communities within each of them. So with that, I thank you for letting me set the stage and I look forward to continuing to engage with all of you in the coming months and years. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marion, for those uh, really uh, very helpful and, and focusing uh, opening remarks. Uh, and just if I could start for those of you that are newer to Farm Radio International, let me just uh, say a few words about us. We're a, an NGO that works to advance communication justice in rural Africa. We partner with African radio stations to use powerful interactive rural radio programs plus mobile communication technology to enable the women, men and youth of rural communities to receive share and impart information that can help them achieve their development goals. We serve over 1300 radio stations across 37 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, and we directly partner with hundreds of these stations to implement communication for development projects in 11 countries. One of these projects is On Air for Gender Inclusive Nature-Based Solutions. The project is still quite new, but already we've been learning a lot about how African stakeholders and rural communities, as well as the Canadian public perceive and are already acting upon climate change adaptation priorities using nature-based solutions. The team at Global Affairs Canada, as you've just uh, heard, that's, that's heading up this Partnering for Climate program, has been clear that knowledge exchange and shared learning should be woven into this program for day one, from day one. Uh, we couldn't agree with that more. There's so much that we need to learn from peer organizations and, and others involved in this work. Uh, and we're pleased and feel privileged to offer some of the insights that we've gleaned uh, through our work so far. Um, <clears throat> we hope uh, that in doing this, that, that this helps to contribute to a habit of transparent sharing and learning within our community of practice. We'll begin with a summary of, of the state of play studies that were done in six countries. And I see that Samantha Bordley is joining us uh, in this webinar who played a key role in organizing uh, these, these studies, uh, followed by a presentation of the first on-air dialogue results in Ethiopia and Burkina Faso. And then some of the data gathered through a public opinion poll conducted in Canada by, uh, on our behalf by market research firm, Abacus Data. There'll be time for questions and discussions as you've heard, uh, but in the meantime, feel free to uh, pose any of the questions you may, that may be occurring to you in the Q&A space. Now allow me to introduce Charles Ta. He is Farm Radio's project delivery lead for, uh, for this initiative, and he's gonna describe 
um, what the studies, the uh, state of play studies were all about, and some of the key insights that came from them. We're still wading through a great deal of information we gathered through them, but we have pulled out some of the key insights that we wanted to share with you today. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you now, Charles. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, so as Kevin mentioned, the state of play assessment were done in six focus countries within the framework of uh, this uh, project, the On Air for Gender Inclusive Nature-Based Solutions for Climate Change Adaptation. And uh, these studies were conducted in the six focus countries, including Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Ghana, Ivory Coast, Uganda, and Zambia. So what did we do in these studies? We did two levels of studies. The first level was a national state of play studies in the sixth country at the national level. And following this uh, national level studies, we now focus on community state of play in 21 target regions in these six countries, really working um, with 66 communities. In fact, um, this uh, approach was used to have the national and community state of play so that we could have more context and insight on nature-based solutions in the countries and the communities where we would be implementing the project. So why did we do these studies? Well, the first thing, the reason why we did the studies was really to uh, build the uh, programs that address country and community specific issues, experiences and needs regarding nature-based solutions for climate change adaptation. We also thought this uh, study would help us uh, provide baseline information for evaluating changes over the course of the project. Also help us to establish connections with players, map key stakeholders and potential synergies. These studies uh, was also expected to be give us a better understanding of the institutional and policy environment, including the opportunities and gaps as far as those are concerned. And finally, um, to help us determine the relevant project geographies that we should be focusing for the project. So how did we do these uh, uh, studies? Well, for the national state of play studies, uh, we uh, use mostly qualitative approach and uh, we designed the tools and uh, we did the data collection. Um, well, we designed the data collection tools and uh, data collection processes. And then we move on to do um, a DEX review. And in fact, for the DEX review, we looked at um, uh, important documents of the countries like the National Adaptation Program of Action, the sector development programs, uh, climate resistant, uh, resilient green economy strategy, uh, other climate change and adaptation uh, policies, strategies and plans uh, that uh, uh, the countries have. So we review all of those documents and we also completed key informal interviews with key stakeholders. Uh, we generated case stories and uh, we did the analysis and we presented the findings to what we call the National Advisory Panel which is really a group of experts at country level that help us uh, to guide us and to advise us on this emerging theme of nature-based solutions. And then we wrote the reports and here we are um, presenting the synthesis of uh, the preliminary synthesis of the findings. So uh, how do we do the community state of play? Well, we conducted this community state of play in, um, as I did mention earlier, in 66 communities in 21 districts across the six countries. And uh, it was basically uh, based on focus group discussions, key informant interviews, and community observations. So uh, what are the insights? What do we gather from this uh, national and community state of play assessments? So the first thing that um, came out clearly to us was that for most uh, public civil society and private sector climate change adaptation actors, nature-based solutions is agroecology or and nature conservation. So we saw that that is uh, generally the understanding of nature-based solution amongst actor, actors. And it tells us that there is a, a kind of knowledge gap in what NBS means 
and how is it different or what it may include. And um, we also saw that there is really a need for NBS leaders like IUC and WWF that could help us uh, help partners to play a key role in filling this knowledge gap. I think one thing that's also emerging from this insight is uh, that uh, the question on how do we use the IUCN standard to guide our work, or perhaps how do we adapt the IUCN standard to be more relevant to community-led initiatives? I think this uh, question emerged as part of this insight. Uh, insight number two, uh, we realize that NBS themselves are threatened by climate change. In fact, we found that many countries in the study regions are reporting consecutive years of erratic rainfall, droughts, and water scarcity, and therefore seedlings used in restoration, for example, uh, reforestation, agroforestry efforts require sufficient year-over-year -year <clears throat> rainfall to ensure strong resilient root systems uh, uh, could develop. So, but because of this situation um, of climate change, uh, these kinds of approaches, these kind of practices, uh, are also being threatened. So we 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 also saw that there is a need for NBS uh, work to focus a lot on mitigation uh, and not only adaptation. So it's not a question of either or, but it's a question of both. Uh, the third insight, um, NBS is, we also realized NBS is not well integrated into main climate change policies, laws, regulations, and strategies. In fact, uh, in nine, 2019, the first ever global assessment of the environment rule of law found that ministries charged with implementing environmental laws, policies, and regulations are underfunded and politically weak compared to those responsible for economic growth and development. So we saw that um, those uh, policies are for uh, climate change and green economy, they are recently updated, they have better, uh, uh, they are better resource, they are politically centered, um, they are better monitored and reinforced, but uh, they are uh, kind of uh, quiet about uh, natural environment biodiversity. So we, we realize that for environment, uh, conservation, biodiversity, and natural resource policies, most of these are outdated. They, on, they are under resource, politically marginal, poorly uh, enforced. And there's really little compliance um, amongst communities in terms of uh, adhering to these uh, policies and laws. So not uh, much was found in, the, um, in climate change and green economy plans as far as uh, environment, conservation, biodiversity, natural resource policies are concerned. So the fourth insight um, that we'd like to share is the fact that rural communities in sub-Saharan Africa are actually aware and are already taking nature positive solutions. I think this is not new. Um, and we are saying that it's really interesting that we could build on and scale up existing inclusive community solutions. And that we also realize that the community groups and institutions can help mobilize, lead, and catalyze nature-based solution actions. I think this tangible, uh, replicable, and uh, sustainable climate uh, action suggests that awareness is really not the bottleneck, but uh, it's a matter of what does the question. So uh, the next uh, insight, number five, is that um, inclusive community actions on nature-based solutions are constrained by perceived and real high trade-offs. For example, we have a high cost of compost manure, labor costs to use ash as pest deterrent, using crop residue as mulch is at the expense of animal feed. And the question here is, uh, we have to consider opportunity costs here. And who pays, you know, often in situations like this, women whose uh, interests are traded uh, uh, in decisions about um, NBS implementation or other agroecological uh, decisions that communities take. So we have to use incentives to really reduce opportunity costs 
of NBS, especially for women and youth. So uh, insights number six, uh, we also realize that many of farm income generating options drive environmental degradation. In fact, across the countries, charcoal production is a huge uh, non-farm or off-farm activity that most uh, agricultural communities are resorting to. Um, there is also sand mining, poison fishing, and uh, we're saying that inclusive community nature-based solutions should include nature-positive non-farm livelihoods. So um, the next slide, um, you want to go back a bit, slide seven, please. Thank you. So what also came out was that customary natural resource management governance arrangements can enhance or hinder nature-based solutions. Customary arrangements may limit women's participation or result in nature-based solutions that impose greater costs and less benefits on, on women. So uh, what options for gender responsive or transformative engagement of custom, customary bodies? These institutions are very critical to mobilize communities to take action. But we know that the governance within these institutions is uh, always uh, not equitable and always, you know, um, uh, not really enhancing for women's participation and decision-making processes that are in favor of women. So how do we therefore um, achieve a more gender responsive uh, customary bodies that can respond to the needs of women? And uh, I will just wrap up by just saying that what therefore is uh, um, the state of play studies uh, helping us in terms of uh, as a planning tool. First, uh, they identify policies uh, that can be popularized through radio. It helps us identify those policies. It also helps us promote, uh, it could also help us promote investments, regulations, administrative practices that can advance application of nature based solution policies. It also very importantly help, would help us to share about uh, knowledge about best policies and best practices from country to country through radio programs and knowledge sharing products. So thank you so much. I will end for this uh, state of play part here. Thanks. Thank you very much, Charles, for sharing uh, the insights. And I know this is a first uh, round of insights from the review of the, the state of play studies, and we wanted to share them, but uh, we're continuing to uh, examine them and explore them, working with our advisory panels, uh, both at the national level and, and one that's at more of an international or global ad advisory level to get further uh, insights, which we'll be happy to share as they, they come out. Um, so now it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce to you uh, Andrea Bambara, who is a senior country representative for Farm Radio International in Burkina Faso, and Borema Benjamin Nama, who's our radio craft officer in Burkina Faso. Both of them are very much involved in our first honor dialogue in Burkina Faso and Ethiopia, and they're going to uh, talk about the process we went through and the results uh, that we've heard from this first on our dialogue on climate change adaptation. So I'll pass it to you now, Andrea and Benjamin. Merci beaucoup. Et donc, je pense que a lot. I think that uh, we are going to speak about uh, the on air dialogue. We will try to share the global results uh, with regard to what uh, Ethiopia and Burkina Faso have done. Uh, please, uh, next slide. So what is uh, an on air dialogue? Uh, what is it? It's uh, a discussion 
among uh, radio stations and uh, communities. So we use radio discussions and we uh, add uh, interaction tools. For example, uh, with uh, uh, telephones and uh, the ULISA platform to gather uh, rural experiences. Uh, this helps us deepen uh, uh, the analysis of a topic and to see what uh, the communities think about a specific issue, for example, and also to get uh, the insight from specialists. So with ULISA system, people call to the platform with a mobile phone and they listen to simple messages recorded on ULISA platform. And then they will reply to questions uh, which are asked to them through uh, the platform and through the answers they will be providing to the questions, they will then uh, be invited to record messages. So we can move to the next slide, please. So this is how the on-air dialogue fun functions. So this is an, an approach which helps uh, uh, listeners and communities uh, to interact together. So regarding the quantitative figures we have had, uh, we worked uh, on two in two countries, Burkina Faso and Ethiopia. So in these countries, we worked with uh, seven radio stations, uh, including three radio stations. Uh, so each radio stations had to produce three dialogues. And so, you can see that uh, uh, they have uh, produced a quite number of uh, dialogues. So in this regard, uh, these dialogues have been broadcasted in five local languages. Uh, as part of uh, these dialogues, 14,000, more than 14,000 people have called, including uh, more than 5,000 people in Burkina Faso and more than 8,000 people in Ethiopia. So for the responses to the poll, we have more than 122,000 poll responses which has been uh, recorded. So for the audio comments, we got uh, more than 9,000 audio comments including 30% uh, women, 70% men, and 52% youth. This is how things went uh, during the on her dialogues in Ethiopia and Burkina Faso. So next slide, please. So you can get the result in through, the, through these uh, links you are so seeing uh, in the screen right now. So you just have to click on these links and you will, you will get all the results. So next slide, please. So uh, what is really interesting is that uh, as part of uh, this on her dialogue, we got some insights from the rural communities. What have we heard from them uh, regarding the change they would like to see? So they said that they saw some changes. So regarding the calendar of uh, the rainy season, they have uh, so some changes uh, as compared to the previous years. 
and also they noticed some changes uh, regarding the volume of the uh, rainfall and the frequency of uh, flooding. So they noticed uh, many uh, changes in these regards. So 52% people in Ethiopia and 72% of people in Burkina Faso say, said that farming has become harder. So because when you have no water, it is difficult to, uh, to farm. So sometimes you start sowing and when there is no rain, uh, the seeds die and you have to so again, so this is a challenge they face each year now. Now, how are the rural communities adapting to these changes? Uh, more than 90% people said that uh, they are adapting by planting native plants and trees. They are also adopting methods to find and preserve resource water. For example, in Burkina Faso, they have the Zai technique and they also have uh, the some rain, uh, some rainwater uh, uh, collection uh, methods. So they also try to take some steps to prevent natural disaster. And they try to cooperate to, to improve farming for everyone. Next slide, please. These are all uh, ways for them to adapt to the new uh, climate changing. Regarding the impact on the biodiversity, 60% of the respondents have observed a decrease in diversity of plants, animals, birds, and insects. So they are saying that uh, they don't see some uh, bird species anymore. So 96% of participants in both countries agreed that it was important to take action to protect the biodiversity if we don't want uh, to be uh, to lose, lose everything. Uh, so we need uh, to find best approaches to protect biodiversity so that uh, we can promote and support more nature-friendly farming and livestock practices. And uh, this is about uh, 41 to 49% people who are saying it. Another approach suggested by the communities is that we should enable farmers to earn income by protecting and restoring biodiversity. This includes 29 to 38% people. Regarding uh, priorities for information, uh, people said that they need more weather advisories because uh, if uh, the meteorological services could uh, provide more services to population, this will help them get uh, better prepared for what uh, they should be uh, uh, expecting from the rainy season, for example. So another priority will be for the communities and the population to see which crop and animals they should be uh, using uh, to adapt more to the changing climate. So there are some animals or some crops which are not uh, suited 
to Venus uh, climate condition. So some crops need less water. These are all information which should be shared with the population, the, the communities. Next slide, please. So, uh, previously we saw what uh, the communities have noticed uh, in the field, but uh, for what they would like uh, to send to the governments, uh, uh, they said that uh, they need the government to governments to take some steps. As for them, uh, governments should try to improve water supply through irrigation, for example. So the governments should also try to protect nature and plant native tree, trees and also make conduct some research on climate smart agriculture. So these are key messages sent from communities to governments. Regarding the difference based on gender and ages, uh, the opinions and insights we get uh, differed uh, from uh, gender and uh, ages. It seems that uh, we have a Okay. Is Ah oui, la connexion était instable à un moment donné. <laughs> OK. Donc, Sorry. vous avez fait okay. le jour de la séance en fonction des textes, du texte et de l'art. OK, d'accord. Donc, je continue à ce niveau maintenant. Nous avons la majorité des réponses. So, en fonction du texte et de l'art, bien sûr, la majorité... Uh, regarding the differences based on gender and age, uh, as you can see, we have uh, okay. over 4,000 women and uh, uh, 6,000 youth who participated. But uh, for women over 30 years old, they said that uh, it, was, uh, it is more difficult to farm today. And their top priority is uh, to got uh, weather advisory and more investment in irrigation uh, now. So these are the messages we wanted to share with the governments. All these are elements we recorded from the on-air dialogues in Ethiopia and Burkina Faso. Thanks for listening. Is that complete uh, your your presentation on the on air dialogue, Andrea? Maintenant, et la deuxième partie, uh, il s'agit oh, yes, for part. the second part now. Very good. From Benjamin, thank uh, you. Benjamin is going to present the case of. Uh, the... Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Mrs. Uh, Bambara. Uh, I will present uh, the case of uh, Burkina Faso. As uh, Mrs. Bamara said it for the first uh, on her dialogue, which uh, took place in Ethiopia and uh, Burkina Faso. We will uh, share first of all the background. Please, slide. 
thanks uh, for this first series of on her dialogue. Uh, we work in three uh, specific regions, including the South region, which measures uh, uh, more than 16 squares kilometers. That is 6.1% uh, of the national territory with uh, uh, populations uh, of uh, 8,074 uh, people. So we have a second region, which is the Bukhudimun region. And uh, this is represents about 12% of the national territory. And the last region is the Obasan regions uh, with uh, more than 25,000 square kilometers. And the population is uh, estimated at uh, more than 2 million people. In, and this was a statistics from 2019. So we can say that uh, this project was uh, undertaken in more than 27% of the national territory covering uh, basically the territory where agriculture is uh, taking place. Uh, next slide, please. For the radio stations which were engaged for the unheard dialogue, we had four radio commun community radio stations which were engaged in it, uh, including uh, Radio Gawa, which is covering a larger uh, area. In the Bukhdi Moon region, we had uh, two radio stations, including Radio Salaki and uh, Voix de Bali. And the last radio station uh, in the Obasan region is uh, Radio Bobo. And all these radio stations uh, included uh, a listenership of uh, more than 1 million listeners. Next slide, please. As for the results uh, in Burkina Faso, we were able to produce with our radio partners 12 re programs, uh, including three uh, programs per radio partners with uh, more than 44 a thousand interactions with uh, five thousand uh, respondents obtained uh, via ULISA out of a projection of uh, more than two thousand, including three thousand and five adults and two thousand and nine hundred youth. These were the respondents to the polls, which enabled us uh, to record the concerns from the uh, communities. Next slide, please. Uh, now we are going to see what are the observations made by the communities, because uh, through the polls, uh, the communities were able uh, to tell us what they have been uh, observing as changes. Uh, among these uh, uh, insights, uh, they said that uh, they noticed a poor distribution of the rainfall in time, and also they noticed uh, soil and forest degradation in addition to it, uh, uh, they said that uh, the traditional 
kids are unsuitable now. There is also the impact of livestock farming on the environment because uh, people are still using the old way of uh, livestock farming. There is also the lack of agricultural inputs and uh, also there is shortage of uh, uh, agricultural inputs, including for water shortage and uh, crops shortage. Next slide, please. As for the findings and the potential topics, including topics uh, communities would like us uh, to address, or address, next slide, please. Uh, they shared with us, uh, they would like uh, to see these potential topics addressed, including uh, good practices for the preservation and uh, the protection of the environment. And as uh, Mrs. Bembere mentioned it previously, uh, there is the land restoration and also the popularization of uh, improved, improved seeds. Uh, because we can see that uh, technical services are working a lot uh, to develop the improved seed. And there is also the need to share with uh, communities uh, the mechanization of an environmentally friendly agriculture. So uh, also research has been made regarding uh, new ways of uh, doing livestock farming. So as for the mechanization of uh, the agriculture, uh, let's see how people can use uh, the different technologies available to them right now so that uh, they can uh, preserve what they already have in the environment and uh, with the biodiversity. Next slide, please. Uh, we also have as a topics, uh, other topics, uh, the access uh, to and the use of agricultural and meteorological data uh, by farmers. As we are talking about, uh, climate change is a big issue right now. And uh, in this regard, uh, farmers need uh, some information on the weather. And also, uh, farmers need to know uh, which kind of uh, hop season crops uh, they can be using and uh, try to see how they can make use of uh, uh, surface water to uh, make use of uh, the less water they have if they don't rain a lot. Uh, in this regard, if they don't have a lot of rain, how the government can uh, subsidize uh, the agro inputs uh, for the farmers uh, since they will need some uh, to include increase uh, their crops and also their yields. So farmers need to have uh, access to, to this input easily. And uh, there is also the need for farmers to get uh, uh, technologies and also methods to uh, manage uh, disaster uh, easily. Because sometimes, uh, even when it doesn't rain, they have strong wind, which destroys the crops in the field. They also need to know about uh, agroforestry methods, which they can use and make a, a profit of uh, the trees they have in their fields, for example. These are all uh, concerns uh, uh, farmers uh, 
needs uh, to have addressed in uh, uh, radio programs. Next slide, please. So this is briefly speaking, what I could share uh, as for the results uh, with you. And uh, you can see uh, in the picture, women who are concerned and uh, uh, really keen to see how uh, farm radio can help them uh, face uh, the different challenges they have. Thank you. <clears throat> Good. Merci beaucoup, Andrea and Benjamin. Uh, the experiences and perspectives and uh, demands of rural communities in Africa seldom come to the attention of decision makers, policy makers, program planners. So it's amazing to have this level of direct insight from over 14,000 rural women and men in Ethiopia and Burkina Faso. And, and, and what I'll just point out, uh, the slides that uh, Andrea presented were mainly the results from uh, answering um, uh, close-ended questions, multiple choice questions, where we, we offered to ask a question and offered some response options. What Benjamin presented was the uh, transcripts of, of uh, some of the thousands of voice messages uh, that were left where, where the questions were wide open and they could speak uh, from their own perspective and, 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 and say really answer the question in any way. They weren't constrained by the response option. So it's quite interesting to hear what people identified and, and spoke of uh, uh, when they were given an opportunity. So um, finally, uh, filling in for Tara Sprickerhoff, who is going to present this next uh, uh, set of in, uh, findings. Uh, she's unfortunately unable to join us today, but uh, filling in very capably, I'm sure, will be Christian uh, Robillard, who you met earlier. He's our head of stakeholder engagement at Farm Radio International, and he's going to present the results of a public opinion survey that was conducted recently uh, in Canada, uh, commissioned by Farm Radio, by um, Abacus Data. Uh, Christian, would you like to take us through uh, what we heard through that? Absolutely. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, definitely would have been in, <laughs> jokingly would have been in some better hands with Tara, but I'm very happy to be with all of you here today to talk about some of the interesting findings that we found. And as as Miriam said at the, the top of our webinar, uh, a large portion of this project that, that we're undertaking is how do we best engage Canadians in nature-based solutions and their implications for the African continent and how best to, to see them involved. So what I'm gonna to do today is share with you just a, a snapshot, a, a snippet, if you would, of the various results that we were able to find through partnering with Abacus to be able to do this research. As you can see, it's a fairly, it's a fairly comprehensive survey that we did, a fairly comprehensive poll that we did. We did a random sample of over 1,500 Canadians over the age of 18 between the 19th and 24th of August, and we made sure that there was appropriate representation based on the most recent um, census data that uh, made sure that we had an accurate sample according to age, gender, educational attainment, and region, uh, and it's considered accurate plus or minus 2.53% 19 times out of 20, so I'm hopeful that the people who appreciate their statistics in the audience um, can appreciate how good that is, and everyone else, you can trust that it's it's of a good quality. So there's a couple things that we'll, we'll touch on today. The first that I'd like to talk about is what do Canadians think about climate change as, as an issue? And the reality is that Canadians, in a very intense way, care very much about what climate change looks like. So as you can see on this graph of various pieces that we had asked of Canadians, you can see that climate change in terms of those uh, Canadians who are extremely concerned is the highest of any of the issues on this list. Some of the other issues that people in this audience might be interested in, and in particular we were, around gender inequality. And while the number isn't as high in terms of those extremely concerned, we still see a large amount of Canadians who are either very concerned or at the very least 
a little bit concerned. And this leaves with some room for more Canadians to kind of enter that tent. But as you can see, the level of, of seriousness that Canadians see climate change as a challenge uh, is quite high. And if you look past these numbers and in some of the other information that we were able to pull from this particular poll, you can see or uh, when we look at who are these actual individuals on an individual basis or on a group basis, about 40% of those who are extremely concerned are women, about 32% are men, and you see a similar kind of distribution amongst those who have a university degree, they're extremely concerned, uh, those who talk about international development issues on a weekly basis are also those who make up the largest proportion who are extremely concerned, and probably to no one's surprise for anyone from BC in the audience, those who live in BC care the most or more about climate change than those in the other pro than those in other provinces. As you can see, this is just a breakdown of some of the, the issues that we felt that this audience would find a particular interest in. And in terms of the concerns about the implications of climate change, specifically in Africa, we can see that while the extreme isn't as high, that 16% number, we can see that the 30 that there is at least a large portion of Canadians uh, who do care uh, about climate change and its implications in Africa. The global number is obviously mu is much higher, but in terms of those who care about uh, its implications in the African continent, there is an interest to, to see something done and, and the concern is definitely there. And then something else that we had to examine was, well, where are we starting from? What do Canadians already know? And what do they already think about nature-based solutions? Like, do they actually understand what it is? And the nice part is that about 38% of Canadians are actually pretty familiar with the impact of climate change in Africa. Um, so we're starting from a place that people know that this is obviously uh, an issue with 6% being very familiar that um, there are significant impacts of climate change in Africa. Uh, and 23% are familiar with climate change adaptations and mitigation practices implemented on the continent, but only 3% are very familiar. So there's a large amount that we can that we can work with to educate, educate Canadians about how Africans are ultimately mitigating the effects of climate change. And we can see here when it comes specifically to nature-based solutions, what you're looking at is the comparison between those who are uh, familiar with the concept of a nature-based solution versus those who are familiar with the term. And interestingly enough, the concept of a nature-based solution uh, is higher than it is for the, the term itself. So the idea behind it versus the actual technical definition. So people might know, people already know what it is. They might just not know the actual technical definition about it. And you can see here as well that those individuals, about 90% uh, or 33% strongly agreeing that nature-based solutions as they know it are a really fundamental and key component of climate change. Uh, and being that as a solution on the African continent, you also have 90% with 35% strong agreeing that nature-based solutions are a responsible solution to climate change. So not just that they should be done, but that they're the responsible choice to ultimately do. And 89% of Canadians agree, and with 26% of those people strongly agreeing that nature-based solutions are a holistic approach. So they allow, they uh, are helping in a very holistic way, a comprehensive way, and a balanced way to be a mitigation technique and, adapt and an adaptation technique to climate change uh, and helping to address some of these other social issues. And something that we were curious about what was also what are Canadians currently doing when it comes to climate change? Are they involved at all? Well, we were really interested to see that there's already a good amount of involvement in nature-based solutions, but even more important, there's uh, an appetite, over half of Canadians polled have an appetite to actually be interested and potentially involved in using or learning about nature-based solutions. 
uh, and in particular with their, their focus on Africa. And these are the ways in which they're interested in, in being involved and being educated. So going out and self-educating themselves, making a donation, educating others, volunteering. There's a lot of appetite there and particular appetite to self-educate. So for us, we know that there's opportunities where it's that sort of old adage of, if you build it, then they will come. So if we go with an intent to educate and to have these materials prepared, and if you in your own roles go with the intent and the materials for people to self-educate, there is an appetite and an interest in these sorts of things. Now, something that I think is important too is wondering, well, what do Canadians think that Canada's role should be? And if they think that Canada should have a role, kind of an important point where you can see that there's obviously an issue, but does it actually ref is it actually something that Canadians want us to do something about? And the nice part is that 33% of Canada uh, Canadians want to see Canada be a leader in solving climate change around the world, just across the board. 55% want Canada to do its fair share, but not necessarily more than other countries. And 11% don't want Canada to play much of a role in helping to solve climate change around the world. But there's already a, a large amount of Canadians who are very interested in seeing us at least play some type of role uh, relative to, to other countries, which is nice. So we've established that there's an appetite there and there's a lot of enthusiasm for seeing Canada do something around climate change. And when it comes to seeing, well, what do you, when it comes to helping these communities adapt to climate change, what do they actually want Canada to do? So when you look at young people, about 49% of youth want Canada to be a leader in solving climate change around the world. So we have a, a young population who's very keen to see Canada do something in a leadership role to help those around the world. 38% of those with university degrees and 37% of parents uh, with children under 18 also agree with this. They wanna uh, see Canada be a leader, which is interesting. So you wonder whether or not the young people in the lives of these parents are potentially swaying them or if the parents themselves are looking to have a, have a better world for their children. And 39% of those who regularly think and talk about international development also about the same, that Canada should be a leader. So it comes almost as no surprise that those uh, who continually educate themselves on this want Canada to take a leadership role in this space. And when you look at, well, are there specific things that people want Canada to do in terms of focusing on climate change? You can see that 30% want us to focus on solutions in Canada, that 14% want us to focus in other countries, 47%, so almost half of all Canadians, want us to do both. They want us to focus on solutions both internationally as well as in Canada. So there's an appetite there to see more work or continue to work being done and potentially have that leadership role as well. And 9% don't want us to focus on climate change anywhere. And when it comes to the question of whether Canada has a responsibility to support uh, global action on climate change, especially in low-income countries, you can see that almost 80% of Canadians want us to do at least, uh, that we have some type of responsibility there. So again, the appetite is definitely there for us to be able to do, uh, for us to do something and that we have a responsibility to do so. And as you can see here, 67% support Canada's efforts to support Africans, uh, African countries using nature-based solutions. So there's a large amount of, of appetite and will to see uh, Africans be able to, to uh, use these nature-based solutions to be able to do something about climate change. And, and when it comes to that, that two-way learning, so the way that uh, we can learn from African countries, 83% uh, of Canadians think that uh, the Canadian government can learn from African communities on how to use nature to address climate change, and only 4% strongly disagree. So there's a huge amount of people who, are, who feel that we can learn something from the African continent, and a very small amount who are strongly, vehemently opposed to something like this. And 83% of Canadians think, themselves, think that they themselves can learn something from African communities. So there's a willingness there to engage in that two way of learning and not just seeing Canada as the person as the entity that holds all of the answers.
So in summary, what we can see is that there's a, a young, motivated group of individuals who are very, very keen to seeing something be done about the, the climate crisis and to use nature-based solutions. And while the amount of people is still small, relatively speaking, who understand nature-based solutions, both the concepts and the terms, there's a lot of appetite to self-educate. And we see that as a role that Farm Radio will be, will be playing as we roll out some of our communication and, and community engagement activities across the country when it comes to the, the nature-based solutions project that we're taking on. Uh, thank you for listening and happy to answer any questions. So pass it over to Kevin to, to uh, wrap us up and to take us into the questions. Thanks very much, uh, Christian. Uh, you know, it's very interesting to see uh, these results and what comes across strongly is that uh, this approach it garners a lot of support already in Canada. And as you said, there's an appetite to learn more and, and, and potentially to do more. Um, and I was really pleased to see that there's this openness to, to learning and a humility there, a lot of Canadians seeing that there's something to learn and something from, to gain. It's not just a one-way street, uh, but an opportunity for shared and mutual learning. <clears throat> so that concludes our three presentations. And you know, like a lot of research, a lot of questioning, probing, uh, raises as many new questions uh, as it answers. So uh, we're really happy to, uh, to spend time now in a, in a Q&A, but some of the cues that you have, some of the questions are, are questions raised by the research that, that have to be answered through no more research. Um, but I think, I think generally what we're seeing in terms of some common themes uh, running through the presentations, uh, is you know recognition whether it's in rural communities or here in Canada that uh, climate change adaptation is urgently needed. It's 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 happening. People are taking action already. Pr promoting, protecting, and embracing ecosystems, biodiversity, are widely seen. Whether it's in, in again African communities, uh, uh, different uh, stakeholders and groups in, in Africa and here in Canada as uh, vitally important solutions. Uh, and while individuals and communities are taking action in African communities and countries and here in Canada, there is a critically important role for governments and for international cooperation uh, for these efforts to have the needed impact. Um, so we're in the early stages uh, of this program, uh, and I know that much more will be discovered by Farm Radio and learned and by the other uh, the others in this community of practice. And I really look forward to, uh, to future events like this one um, as, as the work unfolds so that we can grow together as a, as a community of practice. Um, now that many questions have been coming, uh, coming through, uh, so let's, let's turn over to the Q&A feature um, of, the, uh, uh, of this uh, webinar. And I'll turn it back to you, Christian, to help facilitate um, uh, this session of the uh, webinar. Great. Thanks, Kevin. And a reminder to everyone to use the, the Q&A function at the bottom if you if you have any. Uh, lots of questions around if we'll be sharing the slides. Absolutely, we'll make sure that those get distributed after the webinar is done, along with a, a recording of it as it's being recorded, obviously. Um, one, uh, one person in our audience, Paul, asks, um, and whomever would like to weigh in on this, uh, please feel free to do so, but wondering how youth is defined up to what age? And I believe we put in the chat around 30, uh, 30 and under, but I'm wondering if anyone wants to go deeper on that. Uh, so I'll turn it over if anyone has any particular particular pieces to, to add. Maybe Charles would be a good person to, to talk to us through, but I, I imagine too that, that Andre and Benjamin, you could also have some thoughts. So Charles, maybe I can start with you. Yeah, I think this question has come up quite often. Uh, thank you, Christian, and thank you, Paul, for the question. Um, well, we asked the countries to give us the range that is considered as youth in their respective countries. And there's quite an uh, intersection in terms of that range, but there is also, uh, like, for some countries, it goes beyond 30 to 35, you know, and even be below um, um, 20 years or 21 years for some countries. So. Uh, it is fair to say it is uh, 30 years, but it's really um, country specific. It's a range that varies from country to country. I mean, in the six countries where we are working here. 
uh, I'll just say that um, in the in the on our dialogue survey, uh, the first two questions asked every time they call to participate is about their gender, and then we're asking, are you uh, under 30 or 30 and over? So that's that's the range of options we gave them. So when you see the honor dialogue uh, breakdown by by age, it's it's based on that. Even if the country specific country might have a different definition of youth. Terrific. Uh, another question from the audience from Frank was, and perhaps this is one for uh, Andrea and Benjamin. Frank asked, was there any mention of the need for greater investment in the recovery of traditional crops or species that may have a greater resilience to climate change? Sarah, tu peux reprendre la question, s'il te plaît? On n'a pas bien compris. Um, I can just jump in. Uh, Andrea, the question is whether any of the respondents Thanks a lot. Uh, let's say that, uh, uh, mainly speaking, people uh, don't need uh, to come back to traditional crops or species, but uh, they need more investment uh, in improved seeds or crops because based on the areas where they have uh, they need seeds or crops which will yield more uh, in their uh, region their areas and what they need more is uh, to have more access to these seeds, for example. I don't know if I answers in, to your question. Frank, would you be able to put in the, in the chat if that helps to answer your question or if you wanted some extra uh, clarification for that? And then as we, as we do that, we're gonna move on to some other questions and we can, we can come back to it. Can I just add something? Sure. Richard? Kevin here, yeah, yeah. The as as I mentioned earlier, we had the close-ended uh, questions where response options were provided, and that's not a, a question we really explored through the close-ended, but could in in a future on-air dialogue. And there will be many more of these over the next uh, four years. But there were many voice messages left, uh, open-ended responses. And, uh, and what we've heard from Benjamin is that in, uh, in, in Burkina Faso, at least one, one thing he heard a bit more commonly uh, was uh, the need for uh, what they called improved seeds. So that was what they was said when prompted to leave um, uh, uh, their own response to a general question. <clears throat> um, there were over 9,000 voice messages left. And to be honest, we haven't, <laughs> we haven't translated all of them into English or French and reviews all of them yet. There's still so much information and commentary there yet that we still have to review and, 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 and analyze. So that's a part of the data, part of the data set that is still may have a vast amount of additional information that we haven't we, we, we've done some analysis of it the best we could in the time we had, but there's, there's going to be lots more good value that comes out of the that assessment. Great, thanks for that, uh, that, ex that uh, expansion on the explanation, Kevin. Uh, we have a question from the audience, and I apologize if I, if I mispronounce your name, from uh, Amplacine. Um, Amplacine asks, are there any challenges in using radio stations to reach rural communities and invite them to share their experience on climate change and NDS? Not sure who might like to, to step up to take that. 
Um, but I'll put that out to, to our panelists. Sorry, Christian, who, whose question is it, please? Uh, maybe I can start with uh, maybe I can start with you, Charles, if you'd like to try to answer this one. And then Andrea and Benjamin, if you have some thoughts as well, then you can also weigh in. So the question again is, are there any challenges in using radio stations to reach rural communities and invite them to share their experience on climate change and NBS? Thank you for the question. I guess um, Andrea and um, Ben would provide more accurate feedback, but I think this, uh, what we have just presented today on the on-air dialogues uh, is proof of the fact that where communities can be engaged by radio stations to share their perspective and uh, their experiences with climate change. And um, uh, as uh, earlier mentioned, this is the first part of a whole process that we'll be doing on an annual basis it means that we would collect this feedback and will help us inform the programming to address specific issues on nature-based solutions with the communities. So it means that the on-air dialogue is a program type specifically to generate information from communities. But how, what do we do with that information? How do we support them based on the information together with our partners to be able to take actions on climate change adaptation using nature-based solutions is the next step of our programming process, which will involve different types of programming models like um, documentaries and the participatory radio campaigns that really leads community to that point where they are able to take action. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Charles. Andre and Benjamin, do you have anything that you'd like to say on this question or add to what Charles had shared? Anna, I don't have uh, yes. access to the document, so I can't answer to the question. Maybe I'll move on to a different question then. Um, yes, please, Christian, because I haven't been able to catch, to get the question. Yeah, and just for your Sorry. reference, Sarah, all the questions are at the bottom of the, the document of the, the run of show. Um, another question, okay. uh, others have asked if we can make the survey results available. I believe that we'll be able to do that. I'll clarify, but I don't see, I don't see why not. Um, another question, uh, okay. uh, another question can go to Charles, um, somebody, uh, whose name came up as speaker said it would be interesting to hear more about the trade-offs identified in NBS in the state of play studies, in particular, which communities slash groups may lose out if biological- Donc, materials... en fait, uh, oh, Sorry, sorry, Christian. Yes, Sarah. No, it's okay, sorry. I was oh, in the English room. Uh, I was asking, Char so Charles, uh, somebody in the audience asked, it would be interesting to hear more about the trade-offs identified in NBS in the state of play studies, in particular, which community slash groups may lose out if biological materials are used for NBS instead of their traditional application. Oh. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Chris, and thanks the person for that question. I think this is a very important question. Um, well, I will start by saying that in addition to issues like power dynamics and inequalities, you know, that are embedded in uh, communities, uh, community structures and systems, uh, we could quickly already suggest that women would be biased against in, the, um, in things like this. And if you look at the determining factors, that which we mentioned being cost, labor time in implementing nature-based solutions. Again, it can suggest that maybe women um, can be disadvantaged um, as far as uh, 
you know, the, the, these solutions are concerned or the trade off uh, that are involved are concerned. But interestingly, just take a look at one of the examples that we have for Burkina Faso. We learned that ash, the use of ash as a pest deterrent, was mostly practiced by elders. And youth or the younger adults, they perceive this method to be too tiring and labor intensive. So again, we would have suggested that, well, the elders, uh, as it's more labor intensive, mean this would not be something for them. But we are seeing that they are the ones who are doing that, and youth are the ones saying that it is more labor intensive and uh, they wouldn't adhere to that. So it's to say that, well, it all depends on the solution and um, yeah, and the, the community circumstances in question. So it's hard to say, but I think the guiding principle is that uh, if we are talking about these determining factors, cost, time, uh, labor involved, we can already start to um, uh, determine which kind of groups, you know, would be affected by this. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Charles. I think we have time for one or two more questions, and then I will uh, pass it off to Kevin to take us to take us out. Um, Francis asked, what will you do with the results of your Canada survey? So what we'll be doing are a lot of initiatives to engage uh, Canadians in uh, how Africans, uh, on how uh, people on the African continent are using nature-based solutions to adapt to climate change. Um, some of those things will include events, knowledge products, podcasts, a wide variety of, of kind of communications activities, um, all centered around telling those, those stories from things like our on-air dialogues and other, um, other engagement activities on the continent. So that the idea will be to, to educate Canadians about what is happening on, on the continent um, and then potentially how they can, they can be involved or, or what they can learn from uh, from African farming communities when it comes to, to building that resilience against climate change using nature-based solutions. And the last question I'll ask, and uh, not sure exactly who to, to put it to, um, but Linda asks, do you have any information related to older women, many of whom still continue to farm? Is there anything that we have around how uh, around older women and their their involvement in farming. The the um, on our dialogue polling questions uh, had had that question about age and only asked about over and under thirty. So we have over thirty and in women over thirty we saw that their differences, their, their responses differed a bit uh, in a few areas. In most of the questions, they were similar to the others, but there were a few in which it was different. Uh, women over 30 were more likely to report that farming was harder than it used to be. Um, they, they, they spoke about uh, the importance, more likely to identify the need for uh, improving availability of water including through through irrigation. Um, so, so there were some areas that uh, where older women were, were, had slightly different responses. And when you think about you know, the labor and work involved in, in farming, it, it, it's, it's not maybe surprising that there were those particular areas where we saw a difference in response. Great, thank you for that, Kevin. If there's nothing else, I'll pass it back over to you, Kevin, to uh, to close out our webinar. But thank you, everyone, for all of your thoughtful questions. And if you have any any extras, please do put them in the chat, and we can see what we can do to to get to those. Thank you, uh, Christian, and, and thanks everyone for uh, sending your questions our way and, and facilitating this discussion we've had um, at the end. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, research like this poses all kinds of questions for me uh, and for others uh, that, that calls, uh, calls upon us to do uh, more consultations, more engagement, more research. And indeed, that's going to be a key part of the program going forward. And we certainly look forward to more uh, community of practice uh, events and exchanges with all the partners involved in this initiative. So let me close. Um, 
and then by, by thanking uh, all the participants, in particular, uh, uh, Miriam Montrat, uh, Director General, uh, Charles Ta, Andrea Bambara, and Burema Benjamin Nama, Christian Robillard, a special uh, appreciation to Sarah Karambiri, who uh, provided the translation uh, for this event. Very important and difficult job. So thank you to Sarah. And also special thanks to Carrie Max uh, from Global Affairs Canada for instigating and supporting uh, this webinar. Again, looking forward to future ones, Carrie. Uh, so thanks to all of you for your participation and uh, look forward to future engagements. And I hope you enjoy what remains of this day for you. Thank you. <laughs>